So this presentation is um, about a first pass design uh, and the design flow, design methodology for a broadband uh, 100 watt PA. So we'll cover the RFPA requirements, uh, passive losses calculation for the uh, device periphery sizing, the device model stability and validation, input matching network, load pull network synthesis and analysis, EM simulation of, of the networks, and then the RFPA modeled behavioral model performance and layout, um, and then the measurement, passive and active, and then conclusion, summary. So the initial requirements for this amplifier were operating bandwidth of 0.7 to 2.5 gigahertz, um, output power 100 watts uh, saturated, uh, minimum 49 dBm, 80 watts, gain flatness at rated operating power plus or minus 2 dB, 15 dBc harmonics, VDS 35 volts, drain voltage 35 volts, and then a, a DC current consumption of up to, um, well, up to 16 amps. So to size the transistor um, and get an idea of the actual transistor periphery, you actually need to get the 100 watts load power. Um, this was a balanced amplifier. Um, that was the, the architecture I used. A uh, number of practical reasons is you, you can't get isolators, or certainly not in the size that we were working at across this band. Um, so single-ended isn't going to be an option. Um, so it was a drive stage into a balanced output stage. So <coughs> based on that, you've got a number of losses which lie between the SMA output and the actual transistor load pull plane or the package plane. Um, in this case, we've got an output matching network plus the hybrid. So an estimate for the network lost the output matching network over this band transforming from the low impedance to high impedance and the hybrid loss was about 1.5 dB. Then a PSAT variation for device spread and temp were about 0.4 dB. Um, conclusion of all that is to get 100 watts at the SMA from this balanced amplifier, you're going to need about 80 watts per device at the low pull reference plane. And that, that always surprises people because I've seen it before, you, you, people get two 50 watt transistors, you know, they don't account for the losses and then the final amplifier runs short of power and there's, there's no way you can actually get that back again. So the device model, so it was 125 watt GAN on 25 micron process device, um, VI sensing uh, at the current generator plane. Uh, now this was actually a 50 volt device. We were running 35 volts. So part of this presentation, like later on you'll see that we had to validate this model um, at 35 volts. Uh, you can see the self-heating, uh, the device IV curves, the self-heating effect in there. That can be scaled between zero off, one fully on, so one is CW, um, 0.5, 50% duty cycle. Uh, and you, you can also see, I mean, if you've not used, uh, if this is a new device and you've not used the device before, it is a good idea just to have a look at these curves, look at the breakdown voltage, um, and, and just give yourself some confidence with the, with the model. And again, if you've not used a device before, just looking at MAG, MSG, K factor. So you can see that you've got very high levels of gain down here, which you're going to need to remove. You've also got over your operating band, you've also got about a 12 dB uh, gain slope to correct. So <clears throat> 50 volts, you compare the, the, the vendor load pull 
and the AWR load pull, and, and as expected, you, you get a good correlation. Um, but what we need to know is, is what about 35 volts? Um, so you can, you can just simply scale the drain voltage ratios. Um, that'll give you a rough idea. Um, but moving from 50 volts to 35 volts, you've reduced drain voltage by a third, but you've pretty much now halved the driving point impedance. So you'd expect higher network losses. Um, we also got, as well as just relying on the AWR load pull in the device model, the vendor actually performed a load pull at, at 35 volts. And as you can see here, this is a power tune. They did a power tune, an efficiency tune. We are meeting that minimum of 80 watts here. So a power tune of this device at 35 volts, it also correlates very well with this scaled drain voltage ratio. The efficiency tune, usually when I design an amplifier, I'll do two matches, efficiency and power, um, typically. We're not going to use, be able to use an efficiency match on this design. It actually falls short of the, of the, um, of the requirement. The 35 volt load pull um, with the vendor and with the model in AWR also correlated very well. So that, that gives us confidence in the model um, at 35 volts, which is obviously what the the behavioral model of the amplifier is based on. So if that goes wrong, if, if that's not accurate, everything else that follows will, will just fall apart. So input match. So different people do this differently, but <coughs> for a broadband amplifier, I try and get the gain flat first. So I work on the input match side. And the, the best way to do that is you don't really want to have to run the nonlinear model and try and, it gets difficult to try, try and just randomly match the input for flat gain using the nonlinear model. So one way of doing that is you've got S11 of the device at IDQ and you can make a simple equivalent circuit. So once you've made that equivalent circuit, which is basically curve fitted to the S11 of the device, you can then evaluate your input matching network um, with using the linear engine. You've basically embedded that series equivalent circuit in this port here. You can now see S21 and S11 as a passive network. So this input match here is designed to actually remove the low end gain and then also flatten out this 12 dB gain variation over the bandwidth. So it's basically a positive slope equalizer. So that gets your gain flat, basically. So <coughs> having got the gain flat and controlled the, the input drive level to the amplifier, what I'll then do is actually, rather than using the source tuner, because over oh, this kind of bandwidth, you can't constrain the, matching, the input matching network to a single gamma point. <coughs> you might be able to do that with a narrow band amplifier, but you won't do it with a broad band amplifier. So what you'll end up with is a big, a big gain slope if you try and do that. So, this is the load pull template that's, that's now been around in AWR since V12. So the source tuner is still there, but it's, it's, it's really just being used as a bias T for the actual device. The input matching network is now in there, and you have to separate out the, uh, you have to basically put a, another couple of meters in for the AB waves, separate out the DC and AB waves. Um, we set this thing up. I did three frequencies across the band. You, you, you might do five or six. Uh, it was a single bias point, uh, swept input power range, uh, fundamental and second harmonic. I didn't have any choice on this 35 volts VDS, so that, that remained constant. Um, so we set that up in the, uh, in the low pull template uh, with the with the device and the output, output tuner, load tuner. So onto the load pull. Um, we set up a number of gamma points. I usually start quite coarse like this and then reduce it down to, to uh, a much more constrained, um, much more constrained number of gamma points. Um, 
this first sweep gives you a good idea of what's happening. Uh, we, you can set up the custom gamma points here with radius, center magnitude, and center angle. And that sets the position of these on the Smith chart. This is the second and third harmonic, just left it at 50 ohms to begin with. So, <coughs> low pull design trade off. So, since V12, there's been this ability. Uh, and it, it's since been developed further in AWR to investigate the trade-offs versus gamma points. So this is the, you were asking about the spread earlier on. Yep. So this is basically how it works. You've, you've, got a number, you've got all these gamma points here. So you've got drain efficiency, um, power gain, and compressed gain here for all gamma points. And then the blue trace, or whatever color you want, highlight, highlights the active gamma. So that gives you a spread overall. And you can do this for any variable. Uh, and you do it with index markers, basically. So you can have, I've, I've set up one here for frequency. So you can see how, for that single gamma point, over, over the frequency range, the three, the, the three points you've swept, you can see how, that's, you can see how that changes. So, a bit more meaningful now. These these contours are now at X dB. I think the 3 dB compressed uh, maximum power, or sorry, load power, drain efficiency, with the crosses being being the maximum values. The three crosses are what happens over frequency. So these are these are quite close together. Um, and you can evaluate those contours over the operating bandwidth again with a, a marker, an index marker. So to derive the optimal load pull uh, impedance point, I've basically got an overlap contour here. The target region was P max minus 1 dB, drain efficiency minus, minus 10%. You can repeat load pull for the second harmonic. Um, this particular design, I only looked at harmonic regions and, and just trying to maximize. I did, obviously, the second harmonic is still in band, um, so I left, I left those alone. Um, but effectively, these, these contours are aligned to, to a specific value with this, this LPC max underscore A. So it's aligned to 3, 3 dB compression. So... I mean, access to these nodes in the device model, if you are looking at harmonically terminated classes of amplifier, working back at the current generator plane is really the, the best way to do it. Um, so these waveforms and dynamic load line show exactly what's happening back at the, the, the current generator plane. Uh, in other words, minus the... the, the the parasitics of the, or the package parasitics of the actual transistor. So <laughs> you can actually work out exactly, you see here, you see there's, the overlap's pretty good, um, but you can relate this to the dynamic load line and you can have region A here, region B here. You can then relate that back to the current waveform or the voltage waveform and you, you <coughs> work out in this case that it's in region A or region B 67.5% of the time um, with the waveform in this transition region for about 32.5% of the cycle. So we've got an input matching network there. That's leveled the gain. We've done the load pull and got a, an optimal point. This tuner is set to that optimal point. It's a single optimal point, but we've got an overlap um, area, uh, a region, if you like, um, because again, we're not going to constrain the output matching network um, response to a single to a single point. There will be some dispersion. So this is the actual final. Well, this is the the, the amplifier performance with the input match and the tuner set to Z opt with the harmonic impedances. So we actually clear, and this is just a single-ended branch. We actually clear the minimum of the 49 dBm, 
but we don't know the effect of the output matching network. Um, you can see the gain is actually nicely constrained here. The, these are all bunched up, so we haven't got a huge spread of power gains and, um, and low powers. So then we synthesize the output matching network. So the target area was centered around, about a, it was about a 9 to 1 ratio, 5.6 minus 1.8 uh, Z opt. This was done manually. Um, it's worth mentioning now, that, as Malcolm said in his presentation, V14, there is this network synthesis that's become available. So it would be interesting to take this design and actually use that network synthesis tool, see what it comes up with, and, and compare it to, to this, this manual design, if you like. But it was based on a third order Chevy Chev network um, an ideal network then converted to the final mixed lumps distributed format um, initially with the X models and then extracted out into EM but also via models um, monolithics uh, vendor model lump components here so again using this port TN. So to try and reduce the loss of the network as much as possible, what I've done is I've taken the conjugate of the target optimal impedance, embedded it in here, and then reduced this problem of the network design to really minimizing the reflection across the bandwidth and hence minimizing the loss. Um, and you can see here that this typical response we've got has managed, we've managed to constrain it to this overlap region. And we see the, the, the second and third harmonics of the response of the, of the network. So you've got a network which has transformed a low to a high impedance with n number of sections. This is a way that I've found you can just evaluate the, the network. So you take the operational power gain of the network, so ohmic losses only, and then you, you plot that, which is the red line, and then you, you say, well, okay, if you take the transducer power gain of that same network, so it's the, that's the network embedded in there, how does that compare? Um, so the transducer power gain is ohmic plus reflective losses. And you can get an idea for how good <laughs> that, that network is, that your design network actually is, uh, compared to what should be theoretically possible for a given number of sections and a given transform ratio. Um, and you can actually work this out. You can take the efficiency of the network, um, perform this calculation here, you'll get a value for insertion loss, and then if you, that actually correlates with the insertion loss of the, of the, of the network. So it, it does work out. So this is the EM simulation now. So this is the output matching network. The same was done on the input. No, I've not shown it here. So we extract the X model transmission lines, and we run the EM. Um, there was actually a very good agreement there between the, the EM and the circuit model. So now we put this output matching network in back into the model. We've got the input matching network, we've got the transistor model, we've got the output matching network. Run the, um, the amplifier model again. And one, again, since V12, one thing you can do now is you can take the load pool data file and effectively look at the nonlinear performance with uh, of the amplifier with the matching network in place. So you, you're using the load pool data with the linear engine, but you're looking at a nonlinear response here. So you've got your load pool data file here. You put in your output matching network here. We're looking at load power 
um, power gain and drain efficiency here, and then we correct for the network loss because we want to know what, what the thing's doing, including the network loss. So that gives you then a way of if you want to optimize this network, you can do it with a linear engine quite easily. Um, the, the downside of that is, is that you'll only see as many points as what you've run in a load pool. So if you've got three points, five points, that's what you see, and you don't know what happens in between. So in tandem with that, once you've done this and you're happy, then it's a good idea, look at it in five meg, 10 meg steps um, with the nonlinear engine and just see if there's any suck outs. Stability, so again, we're just looking at single ended still, so stability circles, K factor, all that looks, not, looks okay. Um, and then we put this into the balanced behavioral model. So this, this approach, I, mean, I call it a co-simulation approach, but it basically you've got input matching networks, you've got hybrids, output matching networks, bias lines in here. All this is, has been designed passively around the load pull from this transistor. So you put all this together and the thing should pretty much work. And it's, it's worth mentioning, I didn't actually use the optimizer in this design. Um, there was no optimization done. I, I did a little bit of tweaking, but there was, there was nothing free running in the background. So as the balanced amplifier we see here, we've got a goal of 50 dBm. This is what we're doing across the band. <coughs> Harmonics, 16 and a half, 26. Then this circuit's laid out. Uh, so this is the layout. So I do a single-ended and a balanced. Um, the three-piece jig here <coughs> was something I came up with, really just for measuring impedances. What it allows, so you've got a copper carrier here for your, your transistor. But before you turn any of this you know, before you actually turn the amplifier on, there's a couple of holes on this face here and on this face here. You can put an SMA connector and just look back effectively at ZS and ZL. So you can actually measure those impedances um, <coughs> with a one port VNA. Um, so before you do anything, that gives you an idea. A, you can do model versus measured data sets, see how close you were, but does give you a good idea of how you're tuning. Uh, if, well, if you want to tune a network where you're actually moving on the Smith chart. So this is the actual passive measurement. So calibrated one port VNA, um, offset electrical delay. Obviously, I've got a connector on here. So this is, this is back to a short circuit point. And then measure input match and measure output match. So you can see there a very good correlation between modeled and measured. But I can also, if I want to tune any elements on this in this network, I can quite easily see what does what, where it moves me. Um, so the other thing you can do with this is, is rather than just a one-port measurement, you, you actually do a two-port measurement of the output matching network, put this back into the interpolated load pull data. So again, this idea of using the load pull MDIF file and looking at the nonlinear parameters, this time instead of the designed output matching network, we're looking at the fabricated output matching network, which is the S parameters that I've measured, and we're looking at load power, power gain, drain efficiency, and that's in there. And again, we correct for the network loss. So the model, certainly over these three points, the model versus measured is, is very close <coughs> between the two for the, for the actual interpolated data, the amplifier. So we <coughs> put this thing together bias it up, 260 milliamps, 35 volts. We look at the linear gain here and the input match 
model versus measure is, 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 is close, very close. Um, we measure, we, we drive up, so nonlinear measurements of the single ended. Again, compared model, model and measured data sets, greater than 10 dB power gain, greater than 45% drain efficiency and a low power greater than 48 dBm. So this is the measured and this is the modeled versus the, the interpolated low pull data. Then in a bit more detail or more detailed sweep, you can see here, that's in 100 meg steps. So that's the single ended side. And then we put the thing, do the same thing again really with the balanced amplifier now is the RFPA, that's the, the behavioral model, what we predicted in the design. This is, so it doesn't quite hit 52 here, but the, the profile is very, very similar. This, this has been no tuning as well. And this thing measured about 130 by, I think, 70 millimeters. Again, in more detail, finer sweep. So 0.7 to 2.5 PSAP, 100 watts, well we 80 watts minimum, we came out with greater than 100 watts, 15 dBc measured, gain flatness, we had plus or minus 2 dB, we're 2.5 dB, so pretty, pretty flat at PSAP. And then obviously the current consumption, um, less than less than eight amps at, at PSAT. So, in summary, we've demonstrated a design flow for a, a broadband 100 watt HPA. Uh, we've achieved that that co-simulation approach and. Um, behavioral model approach, we've got very good agreement between <coughs> measured and modeled data sets. We developed a custom jig which allows tuning of source and load networks um, as well as providing reconfigurable RFPA. So if you do two or three output matching networks, you just, you just take one board off and put another on. First pass design was achieved. There was, there was no tuning of this. Um, and then, yeah, it's a systematic design flow, really developed that includes that device selection, optimal load impedance extraction, um, network synthesis and waveform analysis. Um, just a quick thanks to everyone at NI, Andy Wallace, Malcolm Edwards, Auntie. Um, for the, the opportunity to present here, and then Quovo for the, the additional load pull effort. And that's everything. <laughs>